Welcome to FPTV New Releases, where today my special guest is John Walsh, the award-winning filmmaker, who's here with his second uh, fantastic uh, documentary book for Titan Books. And this is after his Harry, great Harry Hausman book last year. He's now just delivered Flash Gordon, the official story of the film, which is publishing on the 27th of November 2020. It's a beautiful uh, hardback edition with a lovely dust jacket, but it's really, as much as the presentation, all about the content. John, how are you, mate? It's great to see you. It's great to be here, Andrew, and I'm very excited to talk to you about this uh, fabulous new book from Titan Books. Yeah, and yourself, and I'm, I'm very excited to hear all about it. So, John, tell me, what was the genesis of this? Uh, and by the way, I'll just mention what I said off camera, which is, I am legit a huge Flash Gordon fan. And when I was a kid, I actually used to have the quad poster in my bedroom. I, I've always loved this movie. I'm very proud of the fact that uh, my colleagues at Titan Books are actually publishing this. And, you know, very excited to hear all about it. Well, after I'd written last year, Harry House and the Lost Movies, and uh, everyone at Titan was very happy, and I was very pleased that they asked me to put that together. I said, so, you know, next year, 2020, is the uh, 40th anniversary of Flash Gordon. And me sort of rubbing my hands thinking, you know, I've been very clever there, you know, and uh, and of course the team at Titan said to me, no, we know that because um, we, we've tried to do this before. And I was like, oh, okay. So I, I hadn't come up with this kind of really fantastic celebratory uh, anniversary tie-in. And they said, but you know, there, there's issues around the rights. And they said that, you know, it's not an easy project to put together as a book. So I'd always thought, you know, I'd created a wish list, Andrew, as you probably have of making of books I would love to read. And, you know, and Titan have made almost all of the ones I really wanted to see, whether it's Labyrinth, Dark Crystal, Aliens and so on. And, and Star Trek, the motion picture this year was a particular favourite of mine. Um, so they said, look, if you, if you can, uh, it was Simon Ward at Titan Books, who's their brilliant commissioning editor. Great guy, said, but a super talented guy. Fabulous, fabulous guy. You know, I owe him a lot. Um, he, he tied me up with uh, Susie Ray, one of their top editors. I said, look, if you can kind of look into that and find out about the rights. So I did. We managed to get the rights. It was all put together then in, into a legal package. But then, of course, I got the shock of my life that um, we got all of the rights, if you will, but there's none of the assets. So when you open up with those fabulous making of books for sci-fi films that we know and love, you expect behind the scenes shots and storyboards and concept art and photos of the special effects. There was none of that. There was none of it. So there was just the lobby card sets or the front of house sets as we might know them for Flash Gordon. So I spent the best part of a year speaking to fans, going to conventions and just finding out where, if the stuff even existed in the first place and can we get it in high resolution for the book. So I'm absolutely thrilled to say we've got some amazing photos in there from, from across all those categories. You know, the behind the scenes, the concept art, the lost Flash Gordon, the Nicholas Rogue version. Oh, my fantastic it's all in there it's all in there. I'm, I'm thrilled yeah. great supports i got from studio canal and, and tyson books oh uh, how, how wonderful i uh, um, i mean you know all of that for me as a, as a long-term fan of this movie and its unique sort of day glow alchemy that it has I, i'm so so looking forward to reading about that now now you had some great access in the course of, of making this book uh, and I believe that, you know, you spoke with Sam Jones, you spoke with Brian Blessed, you spoke with Mike Hodges. What was that like and what were they like? Well, I'd met Mike before at, um, at, at sort of different functions. We're both members of the Directors Guild. And in fact, he very kindly wrote part of the introduction um, for Harry Howes and the Lost Movies, where five film directors himself, John Borman, John Landis, Guillermo del Toro and Nicholas Meyer, Star Trek II, wrote a little piece about Lost Movies for me. So there was a nice connect already there. Um, so when I mentioned to Mike I was doing this book, he said, well, good luck, because he said, you'll have your work cut out trying to straighten out as it were, all the various story strands. So once I had Mike on board, everyone else kind of fell into place. And we've spoken to everyone who was alive. We even got hold of um, Max von Sydow's son, Cedric. Sadly, we didn't get to speak to the great man himself. But, um, you know, for people who sadly have passed, in some cases, like Peter Wingard, we've been given their last unpublished interviews where they talk about Flash. So I think there's, there's plenty of exclusive stuff, even for hardcore fans. Oh, yeah. So that's that's a real case of Clytus on not bored. Uh, I, I can't mm. can't I can't wait to hear that. I'm a big, big Wingard fan, big fan of all of those guys. How is Brian blessed? Everybody's going to ask you that question. Well, Brian is fantastic because um, when I approached this, it was like one of those true crime podcasts where lots of people have different versions of the events at the time. 
whereas Brian's got a crystal clear memory. He even remembered that Dino De Laurentiis, the film's legendary producer, would run a, a lottery or a raffle every week and he'd remember what the outcomes were. So Brian was great because he's the person you can go to. He's like a Wikipedia in a sense. You can check some facts with Brian, check them then with Mike Hodges. You know, people, particularly actors, have a compartmental view of the production. They know what's happening to their character, what outfit their character had, and what scenes their character had cut. It's very difficult to get that sort of overview. Um, and speaking to everyone, you get a kind of a fragmented view. So it's keen because this was the official version sanctioned by King Features, the rights holder. We wanted to be sure what we were saying was not just accurate, but the actual, the official version, as you will. Yeah. So, so, so for you, um, what have been the highlights assembling the book? What, what are you, when you look at it as the beautiful package that it is, um, what is it that you feel the most proud of? What gets me most excited is I knew the story of Flash Gordon. I knew it was troubled. I knew there was the Queen soundtrack and there was issues with special effects. I was so excited to find out the scenes that were cut, the characters that were cut. I have photos of the deleted scenes, the alternative ending, the spider pit sequence, which has been talked about but never seen. I have the only continuity Polaroid in this book from Melody Anderson. I access the um, archive of Nicholas Rogue images that have never, ever been seen before. So for over 40 years, they've been in a film archive. They were released to us, oh, they were wow. scanned. Studio Canal helped me get those uh, um, released as it were, released into the daylight. They're in the book for the first time. The story of why Nicholas Rogue left the production, John Richardson had worked with him on that. So all of those juicy, delicious, deleted scenes, lost Flash Gordon, what could have been. And you know, the linchpin for this was Dino De Laurentiis, who's sadly no longer with us, but Martha, his wife, spoke to me extensively about Dino's wishes. Dino planned to buy Pinewood Studios in 1978 and had plans to make three Flash Gordons back to back. Yeah. Those details are in the book. Oh, mate, that's fantastic. Now, this might be a false memory, and so I'm going to ask you about it. Uh, the only thing I have clear in my mind about the Nick Ro Rogue version is I seem to recall um, seeing a sort of production design image, which is a visualisation of um, Flash and Dale and Zarkov working in their respective uh, laboratories one on top of the one on top of each other does that ring any bells yes it does yes so there was kind of there was early storyboards that were done for yeah, the mike hodges it. version yeah. and i think it may have been cut from that because as mike hammered through 17 week shooting schedule which sounds like a lot but not for a major motion picture like this with special effects that would be one of the scenes that would have been first either cut or combined with other sequences so I suspect that was from the storyboard set from the, the filmed version, but the, the, the Nick Rogue version, um, the family retained all the materials and they donated them to a film archive. And so when we got those out, they hadn't even been photographed. So they had to be photographed for the first time. So we were pretty confident then that they hadn't been seen before. But you know, we could have left those out, Andrew, and people would have been none the wiser. But I just felt that, you know, I really want to make sure that no stone is left unturned. It's a 200 page book. And yet I've had to do a podcast, had to, but I've done a podcast series to accompany it where I speak to people at Studio Canal, speak to the props people, because to be honest, had I spoke to everyone, it would have been a, a thousand page book. Um, you, you, you have to at a certain point decide what's the definitive story of the film from the time. So people said to me, do you, have you included Ted? Is the merchandise in there? And early on, I thought, well, you know, if we get stuck, we could include that, you know. As I, like they said in Jaws, we could have done with a bigger book. Yes, yeah. it's, it's, it's fabulous as it is. It really, it, it couldn't be better. I'm so thrilled. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm so pleased that you feel this way about it. I, I mean, I really, for all the reasons you've just said, we just talked about, I can't wait to read it myself. How do you find Sam Jones when you met him or spoke with him? Sam was great. And, you know, I, I said to Sam, um, I introduced myself. I sent him a copy of my first book as a, as a sort of a calling card. And um, then we got started on the stories because, of course, Sam and Brian Blessed have been champions of the films for years. You know, Mike Hodges doesn't really go to Comic-Con. For him, it was a rare opportunity to be a gun for hire for Mike Hodges. So it wasn't one of his films, if you will. So Sam and, and Brian were, were carrying the flame. Sam had difficult times on the film. He had a run-in with producer Dina De Laurentiis. He left the picture early. He didn't do the publicity rounds, which he should have done under his contract. It all ended up in a terrible legal kerfuffle. Full details are in the book. 
And, you know, Sam now regrets what happened, of course, and he's very much at peace with it. But I was able to say to him, Sam, did you know this? The deleted scenes, the sequels, what was planned, what was cut. And he said, this is great. He said, I didn't know any of this. He said, I speak so often at conventions. I'm always looking for something new to say. So now Sam, he promised me when he gets the book, he'll do a little Zoom review with me. And so um, I'm hoping... Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, I'm hoping that he'll tell me along with Brian, you know, what are the things that most surprised him? And yeah. uh, I tell you from the get-go, there's at least 20 things he didn't know. Because to be fair, why would he? Yeah, no, of course. I must admit, if I've had one wish, uh, and I think it's, uh, I think this wish uh, this can't be granted anymore, but if I had one wish about Flash Gordon, is that at some point, somebody had gone back in and allowed Sam to read up his vocal with his, with his actual voice, which is frequently an octave deeper than the voice you hear in the movie. I, I, I think that would be an amazing thing to be able to see. I, I imagine his voice has aged out a bit to be able to do it now, but uh, I would love to see that version of, of it with the Sam Jones vocal all the way through. Yes, I mean, you know, for people who know about re-looping and redubbing films, often the sound that's recorded, even on a sound stage, becomes a guide track. And it's not because the quality is bad, but the sound changes in perspective when the camera and microphones are moved. So to give it that more en encompassing um, continuity, then, then actors re-loop their dialogue. So, of course, Sam was unavailable because he'd left the production. So it wasn't that his performance was bad. It was that they needed, in some instances, Sam's voice is, in, is there in some places. In some instances, they needed to, to loop him. Actually, it was more, with more than one actor um, re-loop Sam. And uh, it's a shame, but, um, you know, Sam's at peace with that now. And I think, you know, he very much embraces the film. But uh, had he had his time back again, I don't think he would have got into a punch-up in Soho with football hooligans that put scars across his face. And a furious Dino De Laurentiis enters a, a London hospital, A&E, to find that his, his movie star is about to be stitched in the face two yeah. days before principal photography. <laughs> amazing amazing now now for you john what's the what is the uh what is it about flash gordon that has uh, has spurred you to create this book and why are you such a fan of the movie um, i'm an enormous sort of um fanboy and geek head when it comes to special effects so for me i love superman the movie i truly believed a man could fly i was a gog when i saw that in uh, 19 sort of 78 79 and so when Flash Gordon was coming along, they said there's going to be 100 Hawkmen flying. I thought, wow, this could be like Superman times 100. It wasn't, but I was still fascinated by, by the special effects, spaceships, how they were flown, motion control, all of that sort of rather sort of scientific, technical side of things, motion control and so on. I mean, in, in my other sort of walk of life, I, I do a lot of charity work for the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation. Of course, that's a special effects form of stop motion animation of Sinbad, Jason and the Argonauts, Clash of the Titans. So when I started making films myself on Super 8, I started in claymation. So I'm very interested in special effects. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it's got a it's got a kind of lush um, technical beauty to it that few science fiction films have. I mean, I think just the just the background that you've got as you're talking to us now, that's completely emblematic to me of Flash Gordon. It's the pink, the purple skies, you know, it's, it really does stand alone, I think, you know, as 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 as, as a science fiction movie. Um, and did you get any access to to Dalton at all because it's always been noteworthy to me that out of he's the one person walking through that film delivering a completely straight performance yeah and he's all in on Prince Baron it's such an amazing performance to watch did he get to speak to him in any way did he have any contact with no him? not directly we did have some anecdotal stuff and some unpublished thoughts and comments and through Edgar Wright's we we got some stuff as well um, so, so, you know, he does have a presence in the book, you know, it's a shame he wasn't able to speak to us directly, but I believe that's been the case for different roles he's played, including, um, uh, more recently for James Bond. Yeah, Bond but, um, well, yeah. So, yeah so but, true. um, very few of the actors had anything strikingly new to say. Yeah. Of course, it's the official version, so it had to go in. Um, but for me, finding the special effects people, um, getting hold of the blue screen plans, unpublished special effects photography, uh, the matte paintings, which had never been seen separately at any time, they're in the book. Um, so it, it really is a kind of a who's who of all of the technical aspects. Um, 
uh, you know, if there's any stone left unturned, then someone will have to come and throw us at me because uh, I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> convinced it's, it's all in there. I'm also convinced and uh, I just can't wait to hearing you talk about this is tremendously exciting and just the, the map paintings alone in a standalone format it, that we, that's that's they're so important to the movie and uh, to see you have you know applied such intellectual rigor to assembling this book I just can't wait to have it in my hands I, obviously I've seen seen the pdfs and whatnot but I can't wait to have this beautiful art artifact and uh, it's you know the perfect Christmas per purchase for certainly for science fiction fans and particularly science fiction fans of a certain age who've grown up with this movie and to whom it's so mythic and such a standalone and to, I guess the my closing out question to you would be I mean well, I think one of the great things about Flash Gordon is truly unique as a movie and it, in a sea of you've mentioned some of the franchises along the way Superman which I love of course Star Wars it, it's not like any of those it's really its own thing. You know, so so when you look back now on the year or two you've spent with this, um, what what was the thing, what was the one single most thing that gave you the most excitement in the moment in assembling this book? I think because the the music for Flash Gordon, people forget at the time it was so iconic and so unusual. You know, John Williams and Jerry Goldsmith have created the soundscapes for science fiction throughout the seventies, and it was always orchestral or sometimes Wendy Carlos did something. Um, but to do something that was a rock opera and, uh, you know, we spoke to, to Brian May, who's involved with the book. And because I was so keen to find new things that fans hadn't seen, I'm very aware that Queen fans will come in and take a look at this book too. Shinko Music in Japan, who is a music publisher, did a photo session with the group in 1980, Freddie in a Flash Gordon t-shirt. And I managed to get one of the images that's not been published before in the book on a full page of the entire group. They look as young as schoolboys in it <laughs> and it's just it's fabulous that even to the extent of the music we've been able to find new and unseen photography and i think there are a few new comments there from from queen themselves and and howard blake who, who came in to do the orchestral stuff so every aspect um I, did you know for example andrew that clitus appears in an extended version of queen's flash music promo he comes on at the very end and says a few words and most people haven't seen that it was cut i from absolutely most... haven't seen it i have right. not seen that have, you have will you... hear oh so fantastic it's... i i I, can't, I mean that's worth the price of admission alone as they say i mean what i love about that that great uh, flash theme tune of course is really the brilliance of it is all down to that one great power chord on the keyboard and it's funny how you can often deconstruct music to where the emotional punches it, it's right there and you hear that and you know exactly where you are you know, it's, uh, it, it, it brings it so alive. I, I can't wait to see that Clytus cut of the uh, of the video. That's brilliant. Well, um, we're roaring towards the end of FBTV new releases. I could actually stay and talk to you about this for a whole hour, mate. And um, thank you so much for joining us, John. So Flash Gordon, the official story of the film, it's available for order in the links attached to this video, published by Titan Books, written by the mighty John Walsh. And if you're if you're any kind of science fiction movie fantasy fan who's loved or even been mildly interested in Flash Gordon, this is the book for you. It's an amazing ride. Thanks so much for joining us today, mate. It's really great to see you and chat to you. No problem, Andrew. I hope to see you again on the next book. Right on. You will for sure. By the way, if, if there's any way to do a making of, uh, of Get Carter, you know, I'm all in on that. You know, that's <laughs> not a science fiction film, but thinking of Hodges, that's there. Uh, yeah, and of course, you are working on some other projects of Titan Books at the moment, which I know, once they can be announced, people will be very excited to hear about. Absolutely. No, I'm very excited, Andrew. It's been, uh, it's been a great, great few years uh, at, Titan, at Titan Books. I'm looking forward to, uh, to a few more, I hope. Yeah, right on. You take care. It's great to see you, mate. All the very best. Bye -bye. Thanks, Andrew. Bye now.